Hello and welcome. I'm Dr Tony Wakeford. I'm sitting on the beach at Littlehampton, next to the east side of the mouth of the river Arran. I'm approximately halfway between the eastern and western county boundaries of West Sussex, a distance of some 40 miles or so. Looking south lies France, about 60 miles over the horizon, and looking west lies Bognor Regis, Pagham Harbour, Selsey, and then the county boundary at West Wittering by the mouth of Chittister Harbour. Beyond the Selsey Peninsula, the southern eastern part of the Isle of Wight can be seen on a clear day. To the east lies Kingston, Worthing, and beyond to the mouth of the River Ada at Shoreham, and then the county boundary, once with East Sussex, but now with Brighton and Hove Unitary Authority, as shown in this slide. It is a peaceful and settled scene, but that was very much in doubt in the spring of 1587, amid rising concerns of the prospect of a Spanish invasion. In April uh, 1587, Drake raided Cadiz Harbour to disrupt the Spanish preparations for the Armada and to singe the Spanish king's beard. Drake was alarmed at the scale of Spanish preparations and wrote to Sir Francis Walsingham, Queen Elizabeth's Chief Secretary. He outlined his raid on Cadiz and urged that all necessary preparations be made to counter the anticipated invasion. He added a postscript to his letter, look well to the coast of Sussex. In this talk I will outline the defensive plans for preparedness in 1587 as England braced itself for the Armada that came the following year. Although preparations included the whole 600 miles of the southern coast from Cornwall to Kent, I will focus on the selective part of the western Sussex coast from Littlehampton to West Wittering, as the map in this slide shows. The coastal communities were no stranger to hostile military actions. Almost within living memory, there had been a raid on Brighton by the French in 1514, and then again in 1545, with landings further east at Seaford. It was during that wider naval action that the Mary Rose was lost, while preventing the French from landing on the Isle of Wight. Many parts of the Sussex coast were vulnerable to hostile action, particularly towards the western end of the county, with long stretches of sand and few natural barriers. The Owers Rocks, today approximately seven miles south of Selsey, were a significant barrier, and parts of the coast between Pagham and Littlehampton were described as rocky with limited access from the sea, as the depth quickly decreased from four to two fathoms some distance from the shore. Queen Elizabeth's privy councillors had much to consider when they sent out their instructions to the law lieutenants of the southern coastal counties to review defence and military arrangements. One of the tasks in Sussex was to survey the coast and identify those sites necessary for fortification and beacons. This was undertaken by Sir Thomas Palmer and William Covert, Esquire, later Sir. Both were Deputy Lieutenants and Magistrates of the county. Fortunately, their report and accompanying map still survive so we have a good understanding of their plan, although there is no evidence to confirm that any of the recommendations were actually undertaken. In recounting the events, actions and preparations relating to the Armada, there is one important factor to acknowledge, coastal erosion. The Sussex coast of 1587 was not the same as it is today. There is a long documented history the earliest evidence dating from taxation records in the 13th century that land, livelihoods and assets lost to erosion was a constant and significant economic and social concern for all coastal communities. Thousands of acres and numerous buildings, churches, dwelling and vernacular had been lost and communities displaced due to the encroachment of the sea. A study comparing the high tide line between the 1770s and 1870s revealed that 
particularly towards the western end of the county between Chittister Harbour and Selsey, the sea had advanced by over 250 yards, or 230 metres. The same study noted losses along the entire western Sussex coast, with some places less affected than others, the least being 18 yards, or 16 metres, at Littlehampton. Erosion persisted as an ever-present danger up to the present day. On this basis, it is reasonable to conclude that the Elizabethan coastline of 1587 had succumbed to the sea a very long time ago. The map in this slide illustrates an approximation of the change in the coastline over the centuries. Along our selected part of the coast, the 1587 survey identified four locations to be fortified and six sites for beacons. They also noted four states between Littlehampton and Bognor. This is a local word for those places where vessels could be safely run ashore for cargo or for naval attack. They identified a further three states between Littlehampton and Shoreham. All the states were to be protected with earthworks, trenches and banks. We can now look in more detail at those locations by beginning here at the mouth of the River Arran, and our first notable aspect of change as shown here. The insert map shows the fortifications on the east side of the river, guarding the bend at its east facing mouth. Today the Arran flows north-south, and the fortifications and beacons are probably some distance south of the current high tide line. The next slide shows the coast from the west side of the Arran looking westwards towards Bognor Regis. The 1587 survey shows Cudlow and Middleton churches, which were both lost to the sea in the early 1700s and 1838 respectively. The four states are at Elmer, Middleton, Felpen and Bognor, with beacons situated at Felpen and Bagham. In this slide, the insert map shows the location of the fortification at Pagham Harbour. The 1587 survey shows at Selsey Church, now Church Norton, the fortifications and Pagham Church were more or less in a straight line with one another. The main picture was taken on the foreshore at low tide, with Church Norton behind looking northeast directly towards Pagham Church, whose spire is visible in the centre of the picture. The site of the fortifications guarding the entrance to the harbour are now somewhere midway on the exposed mudflats. The beacons were approximately a mile to the northeast. Church Norton, shown here, was originally Selsey Parish Church, as shown on the 1587 survey. It was recommended to have a fortified site somewhere due south of the church at East Norton, at B on the insert map, on the eastern side of the Selsey Peninsula. This view shows the coast looking north towards the entrance of the Pagham Harbour and the sweep of the bay around to Bognor Regis. From the southern point of Selsey there were beacons at Selsey, Brucklesham and West Wittering. The survey also notes two dove houses as marks at sea. At West Wittering is the last of the fortifications. The insert map on the next slide shows the location of Cakeham Stone, probably the remnants of a boundary marker, midway on the bend in the promontory forming the mouth of Chittister Harbour, and opposite an island identified as Bullers. The main picture shows the scene today from the high tide line looking southwards on an approximate bearing of 220 degrees along the line between West Wittering Church and the fortification, just under one mile, as shown on the insert map. The site of the fortification is now approximately half a mile out to sea from the present shoreline. Each fortified site was to have one demi culverin and two Saker cannons, mounted on a wooden platform with protective ramparts for musketeers and a deep trench in front. A demi culverin was approximately 11 foot long with a bore of around 4.5 inches 
that fired a cannonball of about 10 pounds. A Seika was slightly smaller with a bore of just over 3 inches and fired cannonballs of 4 pounds. Beacons were in pairs and formed part of an extensive network with beacons further inland on high ground, the South and North Downs, forming a chain to London. The beacons would have been similar to the ones shown here. An interesting point to note is that only 36 cannons were allocated to protect the entire 600 miles of the southern coastline. Perhaps there was supreme confidence in the effective placement of these weapons. Or maybe it was a case of economy and more wishful thinking than gunpowder. Fortunately, the military plans were not put to the test. On the 25th of July 1588, the Armada came perilously close to the Oas Rocks and tacked away from the Sussex coast to the south southeast towards France. The danger had passed for Sussex and there must have been a collective sigh of relief and celebration as the military arrangements were stood down. Scares and rumours of invasion persisted during the subsequent years. In 1597 news came that a Spanish invasion force had gathered at Corona. Privy councillors reviewed the plans from 1588 in deciding their response to another possible invasion attempt. There was broad agreement on a change of strategy in not trying to prevent an invasion by engaging with the enemy on the beaches. Instead, attrition became the key focus by conserving military resources and taking every favourable opportunity to harass and delay by skirmish rather than head on battle to wear down and defeat the invaders. In 1589, Lord Burley had noted that relying on the local gentry who were daintily fed and warm lodged did not provide the best outcomes in the field for military effectiveness and leadership, despite their eagerness to serve. There was a growing recognition for the need to establish military organisation on a much more professional and permanent basis. Peace between England and Spain came in 1604 with a treaty signed at Somerset House. Yet, the topographical vulnerabilities of the Sussex coast remained, and Drake's prescient warning, look well to the coast of Sussex, will continue to resonate on several occasions in the centuries to come. Thank you for listening.